All right, so I'll be talking to you about mitochondrial autism and the cell name response. Um, my disclosures are that I'm an unpaid scientific advisor for Autism Research Institute, Open Medicine, and Uva Biosciences. And an important one for everybody here um, is that there are no approved uses of the drug that I'm going to talk about, Suramin, in the United States, and it is illegal to import Suramin for human use without FDA approval in the context of a human clinical trial. Um, for those who would like some resources, um, the first two in this um, list on the metabolic features and regulation of the healing cycle and, and metabolic features of the cell danger response I'd recommend. And then to really, um, uh, if you're really interested in looking at um, some of our work on environmental interactions and impacts on, on child health and adult health, um, take a look at our website. We have a project that we call the 28th Amendment Project that um, may be of interest to some people. So first thing I want to um, emphasize is that uh, there are three kinds of mitochondria, three functional states of mitochondria that are necessary in order to uh, uh, in order to instantiate healing, in order to or after any kind of perturbation that leads to a, um, cellular injury or stress um, mitochondria are, all, are altered in a very specific way. And the cell danger response coordinates mitochondrial function after every injury, and the healing cycle is a genetically programmed, so I call it a, um, an ontogenetic program, uh, uh, that is a three-step sequence that is highly evolved, that is shared by all multicellular life on a, on a planet, um, uh, and is necessary in order to ensure recovery after any kind of injury. Um, and I should say that this healing cycle also has the capacity to change our microbiome. Okay? So how our intestinal epithelial cells interact with um, the, the normal um, ecological regimes of bacteria in, in, in the gut is, is determined by whether those intestinal epithelial cells are uh, under the program of safety or a program of danger. Metabolism controls the progression through this healing cycle, through the steps of the healing cycle, um, through molecules of metabolism that actually have two different functions. So in the same way that um, matter and energy are interconvertible. Um, molecules inside the cell can have a role in intermediary metabolism, like let's say ATP. But then when released in a, in a programmed way outside of the cell, have a signaling function and bind to receptors on cells that will alter the function of the cells receiving that message. So two functions, interconverted, one molecule, we call those metabokines, okay? signaling molecules that were, are actually metabolites as well. So these are the three developmental forms of mitochondria. We call them M0 or uncommitted, um, M1 are pro-inflammatory, M2 are anti-inflammatory, and the CDR is essential after every, every injury. Um, and I'll say that ATP, is an energy molecule inside the cell, but outside the cell is a danger-associated molecular pattern. Some people will call it a damp, but it's a signaling molecule. And so we've, one of the driving hypotheses that, that um, organizes our research is that um, a central problem about all chronic illness, so, in, and we define, so we make a qualitative distinction between acute and chronic disease. Acute disease are disorders that occur because of acute poisoning, uh, you know, physical or psychological trauma, um, or uh, microbial infection. And they typically last less than six months. If a disorder lasts for more than six months, then the body has actually entrained many additional pathways to create a new state of function. Okay? So it, it, it's a really important concept. So the, the first, the deal with acute illnesses, those are kind of, you know, those are the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Those are the things that happen in the course of daily life, a skin, knee, a cut, um, 
it can be a heart attack, a stroke, um, uh, or an infection. But after, if, the, if symptoms last for more than six, six months, then the body has entered a new state of function. Why? Can't some cells heal? Okay, so one of the things that we're really looking at is this rising tide of uh, environmental man-made molecules in our food chain, um, in our water, in our air. Um, and to give you an idea of a study that was done in, um, in 2005 by the Environmental Working Group, um, looked at the, the umbilical cord blood of children and found that over, the average child born in the United States had over 287 environmental toxicants including you know, persistent organic pollutants, pesticides, um, you know, and, and currently many of you may or may not know that, that there are a lot of uh, antimicrobial activities in some of the personal care products that we use. So for example, triclosan is a, a, is a, a, a kind of an antibiotic that's put in toothpaste, okay? And that's, that can alter our microbiome. Okay, so there's, and, and many of the food preservatives, like, um, let's call it uh, mutilated hydroxytoluene, um, BHT, um, are known mitochondrial and coupling agents. Okay, in fact, the reason that they keep your, your, your food safe on the shelf um, is because they inhibit microbial growth. All right, so it turns out that um, when we are injured, okay, so under health conditions, mitochondria form um, a filamentous network, okay? This, the structure of mitochondria is, is very important for understanding their function. Under conditions of injury, that network becomes fragmented. This is the, well, this is the first step of healing. This is necessary. It's a pro-inflammatory state. But then once recover, once recovery occurs, then the, the net, mitochondrial network is reconnected and you, you are able to recover from the injury. However, if there are blocks at quality control checkpoints in this healing cycle, it will lead to a repeating loop of, of uh, cellular function that is attempting to restore previous previous conditions and to eradicate um, uh, a, what, what the, the, the cell's memory of a dangerous exposure. Okay, so currently in the United States, 60% of adults under the age of 65 have at least one chronic illness, and actually 40% of children, 90% of adults over age 65 will also suffer from a chronic illness. All right. So you can go from a state of health to a state of, of um, chronic illness through a variety of different mechanisms, paths that, you know, cuts, scrapes, infections, trauma, toxins, all sorts of different things, genetic environment, genetic problems. But in order to get back to health, you take a different path. I want to emphasize that. So. The path back to health is not replaying the tape that brought you to that, that state of injury. Okay. That's a really important concept. Okay. Um, so by looking at some aspects of the illness, if someone has diabetes, you can give them insulin, but that doesn't cure their diabetes. And in fact, they have to take insulin for the rest of their life unless they do something interesting. They alter their diet and exercise. You have type 2 diabetes. Then you can actually change the metabolic conditions and no longer require you know, treatment for your diabetes. All right. So there are checkpoints. And the process um, can be broken down to a, a choreographed sequence going from um, a a CDR1 to CDR2 to CDR3, each um, uh, supported by the metabolic activities of mitochondria that change to meet the needs of each stage of healing. And it turns out that because of the, the pivotal role that um, certain 
metabokines play, including um, ATP, that if you can, uh, you can remove the blocks from these steps, then, the, then healing can be restored. Okay. So this is a very ancient response. Here, here's a, a mustard plant that's been um, genetically modified to um, express a green fluorescent protein in the, in the, um, uh, whenever calcium is released within the cell. Okay? And here is a little cricket bite. Okay? And it turns out that if you add either ATP or glutamate to this cricket, cricket bite, the following happens. The information of, the, of injury is transmitted to the entire, you know, to the rest of the plant within 90 seconds. Okay, I'll go through that once more since it's, a, you know, something really cool. Um, so, so, this, this, so, so this is happening um, even in plants and, and, and our body has even more, uh, you know, uh, more subtle and, and, and um, uh, you know, elaborate mechanisms for communicating injury throughout um, the body. But ultimately, the, the, what we learned in humans and in, well, in humans is the brain controls metabolism and it has an advisor, the microbiome. Okay, so I'll say that. Okay, um, but ultimately, the, the two have to come to an agreement about what the state of health is. Okay, brain and microbiome. So, this is a picture of the healing cycle. Um, some of you are familiar with the cell cycle. Um, we'll see elements of similarity. But we spend most of our life um, between wake, during wakeful activity and nutrient intake um, when a little bit of uh, metabolites, including ATP, are released. Um, and it turns out that that extracellular ATP is essential for um, uh, initiating um, sleep. And then we go through and finally metabolize that to reduce the amount of extracellular ATP, and we continue in this cycle. But if there's cell loss or damage, excitotoxicity, it leads to this containment response of, that where it uses a, a metabolism called glycolysis. Um, the next stage, uh, so once the damage is contained, cells that are lost have to be replaced and that requires an entirely different kind of metabolism, a different kind of mitochondrial function um, that is called aerobic glycolysis or Warburg metabolism, many of you will know it by. Um, and then once another checkpoint is passed, then we go through this stage of remodeling where the newly born cells are like the kindergartners on the block, okay? They, they don't know what genes to turn on and off but they go to their older neighbors that were you know, left from the original battle and, and are taught what genes to turn on, what genes to turn off um, in order to become a good citizen of that particular tissue. Whether it's muscle, heart, brain, liver, kidney, doesn't matter, the, the same sequence of events happens. All right. So a lot of chronic blocks that we're interested in neurodevelopmental disorders occur close to the end and, uh, and close to what we call checkpoint three. Um, and so you know, we do a lot of work in autism and, and chronic fatigue syndrome and so we're very interested in seeing what we can do to um, allow cells to pass this checkpoint. But remember again, these different metabolic stages don't happen by themselves. They require mitochondrial, structural, and functional change. Okay? These, it has to happen. All right, so Leo Kenner uh, uh, wrote, uh, described the first 11 patients with autism spectrum disorder in 1943, and for 70 years uh, we've collected lists of genes and, and environmental toxicants, um, metals, uh, in utero infections, um, cellular events, um, microbiome events that can all lead to a diagnosis or lead to autism. But one way of unifying this is to say maybe those are just different mallets that ring the same bell. And maybe it's not so much about the diversity of triggers, but it's about the unity of the response. So um, this is a, a picture of a, a brain. This is a, a synapse and microglial cell or astrocyte. And in this case, glutamate is being released into this synapse. 
But the important point here is that what we've learned is whenever a canonical uh, neurotransmission circuit has been identified, ATP is co-released as a neuromodulator of that synapse. Okay? Under more stressful conditions, more ATP is released, and it, it provides for um, you know, a modified signal on the postsynaptic membrane. So ATP is a regulator of the CTR. This is a water balloon that you can imagine might have um, hundreds of little pinholes. When more stress is placed on the water, on the water balloon, um, more of that the water is released as little plumes um, through the holes. And um, cells turn out to have regulatable pores, channels in the membrane, that allow for the release of intracellular contents into the extracellular space where they adopt a signaling function, a serve a signaling function. All stressed cells leak ATP. It's an important message. Okay? And in fact, under safety conditions, that ATP is lower to, to normal conditions, um, but under danger conditions, it's increased. So, mitochondria are constantly sensing the environment. They're talking to the nucleus in the short path retrograde signal. The nucleus is integrating that information, making gene expression changes. And connection P2X7 channels in the membrane are, are opened under conditions of stress allowing more ATP to be released and to, to bind to cellular receptors. And so we went looking. So you can imagine if a cell works hard to produce a certain amount of energy in the cell, ATP, and then has to turn around and release a portion of that to the environment because it needs to recruit cells, like inflammatory cells, to help it fight a, a bacterial infection or a microbial infection of some kind, or even, you know, um, uh, change the, the, the behavior of other cells in the neighborhood after a toxin exposure, um, then if 30% of the ATP is being lost through these channels, um, then the cell does not have the, the energy it needs for normal <coughs> cell growth and repair and, and communication. So we went looking for any drug in the world that could do this, could block the release through these these regulated channels, stress channels, um, of ATP. And when we did that in 2008, there was exactly one drug in the whole world of approved drugs that could, were available for use in, in human, um, uh, in, for human clinical use. That drug was Cermin. And it turned out, for good and bad, or bad, it was you know, one of the oldest man-made drugs in our pharmacopoeia. Um, it was originally made in 1916, and in fact, it is still on the World Health Organization's list of uh, essential medications for the treatment of African sleeping sickness. So African sleeping sickness, and which is uh, trypanosomiasis, and river blindness, which is onchocerciasis, are the only two disorders for which this drug is approved. And that's why there is no approved use in the United States. We do not have those tropical disorders. So, if you come away thinking that all it works about sermon, then I haven't done my job correctly. Okay? This, so we're really trying to think, introduce a new way of thinking about the causes and potential treatments for complex neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and, and many other disorders that have at a fundamental basis a persistent cell danger response that blocks healing, blocks recovery, blocks normal child development, okay? Blocks the normal development of a microbiome. It changes its, you know, its, uh, it changes the diversity. So, here's ATP. So we think about this as armistice therapy. If we have a drug that can tell the cell the danger's over, the war is over, then maybe the cell can get back to the business of health. So the, this is the, the, the basic idea, is that the CDR creates roadblocks, and therapies that remove those roadblocks can lead to improvement. Uh, okay. <laughs>
So we did, we conducted a phase one, two clinical trial uh, testing whether uh, this 100 year old drug that's been used to treat African sleeping sickness uh, might be able to unblock the cell danger response um, and lead to healing. So here's a cartoon of a neuron with a nucleus and mitochondria. Um, and, and these are the channels and the receptors, G protein called receptors that respond to ATP. So the cell under stress conditions is releasing that ATP. ATP binds it sends a signal to the nucleus and it changes the, the actual functional state of the cell. But if you can provide a drug that blocks that the, the loss of the dissipated loss of ATP and competes with the extracellular signaling of danger, then the, the, the cells may be able to resume normal development and communication. And so that led to the sermon autism treatment trial, the SAT1 trial. These are the 10 pioneers. Um, we had uh, boys that were paired by, by age um, and uh, age, autism severity, and, and IQ, and then randomized um, to um, receive either sermon or placebo. Um, we had four um, uh, young, young men who were nonverbal, very severe or or motor dyspraxia, hadn't really spoken anything more than fragmented words or, or maybe um, up to two words together. Okay. And, um, and within, so, so what we started noticing after you know, beginning the infusions is half the kids weren't showing any change, and half the kids were showing dramatic change. And that dramatic change had this characteristic of uh, allowing a child to gain developmental milestones in an accelerating momentum, you know, not, not, not unlike um, a, a steam engine leave, leaving the, the, you know, the, the you know the, the terminal, um, and uh, so some of the things that happened that children um, who hadn't really spoken in more than um, two word sentences were you know beginning to, to stop and uh, stop their parents and say I finished my dinner I learned to play tag with the kids at school today notice that that also is that's, that's two wins um, not only is the child telling about um, you know, the day that they're telling about a social activity during the day that they never participated in before. Um, this young 14-year-old um, began to actually sing and dance and practice making new sounds with his tongue and lips and mouth um, during the first week of, of after the infusion. Um, and uh, on a Saturday afternoon when his dad was making a sandwich, he walked in and he, his first sentence as a teenager was, I want to eat chips. Um, and, and, and kind of an understandable sentiment, I think. So, um, the, so, so and, then, and this young, this six-year-old said his first sentence was, "I want to have a drink." And um, a, a young man who had more uh, more language to start with, but was very um, uh, socially um, uh, restricted. Whose mom had taken him to, you know, takes drive him to school and would walk across the the the, the um, pedestrian crosswalk, uh, and an elderly lady in her um, uh, in her crosswalk uh, um, uniform would always kind of be a little bit scary to him, and he would walk across, um, you know, uh, always averting his gaze. And one day, you know, the first week afterwards, he said. Uh, today I want to say hi to the crossing guard lady. If you want to, if you actually want to see many, many more of these anecdotes, um, you can go to our website and read about this. So these were all we had the parents um, actually write out a narrative of things that they saw um, during the course of the of the treatment. And what's interesting is half the parents um, said no change, and half the parents some wrote pages of all the changes that were occurring. All right. And so when we broke the, uh, the blind, um, the, the, the children who had improved had received sermon, and those who had no change had received saving or placebo. Um, this is an example um, that it, it gives a, a lot of uh, texture to some of the results. So this is a 14-year-old um, young man who had um, 
uh, regressed at two and a half years of age to silence. Um, and, uh, but before he had regressed, he loved listening to music and listened to um, a, a walk band and had a particular folk artist that he used to listen to at two and a half. That all disappeared for the next 12 years. He had never even picked up a computer, although he had a 16-year-old neurotypical son, a neurotypical brother. Over the course of, of the, the study, not only did he learn how to use the computer, he found YouTube and he was able to found, find the very same folk singer that he had listened to when he was two and a half on, on the YouTube. And, and you know, when his mom saw that, you know, tears came to her eyes and she gave me a call and he said, that has been inside all these years and just could not get out. The other little point to note is um, the family dog recognized this new sense of you know, calmness, uh, a, a kind of you know, uh, comfort in his own skin that um, never had occurred before. This little dog would never spend any time with him um, previously, but would spend hours you know, over the next month um, after, after this um, study. So um, scientific progression is not really built on anecdotes, it's built on the quantifiable data. And, and so, this, you know, so these are some of the data. We actually did something that most studies are, uh, that look at autism outcomes don't do, is they use literally the tool that's used to define the disorder, okay? of autism spectrum disorder, which is ADOS, okay, to as an outcome measure. Okay? Because we wanted to see, is it possible that some of these children could come off spectrum? All right. So after six weeks, um, the, what we noticed, well, so, so when we collected all the data and looked at the, looked at the results, is that there was an average of 1.6 points improvement in the ADOS score. That's actually, I'll talk about this, but from the definition of ADOS, autism spectrum disorder is an ADOS score between 7 and 10. Okay, And they went from 8.6 to 7.0. With p-values with just five children of 0 0.0028, and the placebo was not significant. And we had similar improvements in um, aberrant behavior and ATEC scores were significant and not in placebo. We also did metabolomic analysis showing that both the, the mouse models that we had conducted earlier, the maternal immune activation that Dr. Mazmanian had talked about, and then also a genetic model, this Fragile X model, um, had about 75% of the pathways disturbed um, that the, the children did and all of these pathways were improved after, after the dose of serum, sermon. So this is what I, I alluded to earlier. This is ADOS. This is the threshold for autism spectrum, week seven. The average child that was in the sermon group had a score of 8.6. Um, and there was a very significant decrease no significant decrease in, in the placebo. You can see that the, the standard error bars. And the question that we want to ask next is, you know, that was one dose in six weeks. What if we give three doses over three months? You know, could some children come off spectrum? Um, so the results are that low-dose sermon was safe. Each of the five children, that's literally 100% of the children, we did not have any non-responders in the, in the group. Um, uh, you know, received sermon, uh, who received sermon, improved language, social interaction, decreased stems and restrictive interests. Um, but in addition to that, there were non-core symptoms, accelerated development, learning milestones, decreased anxiety and, and decreased meltdowns, novel situations, improved sleep, new interest in foods. Children who were, you know, constitutive carnivores started asking uh, for greens you know, on, their, on their dinner plate and kids who had, uh, were, were you know, uh, really vegetarian started asking for, for meat. Okay. Um, so uh, magnified benefit in the usual ABA speech and OT. And, and none of the children who had received placebo showed any of those improvements. So the big question is, is sermon safe and effective in the treatment of autism? And can it be used um, to help some children come off the ASD spectrum and leave some of the symptoms that um, hold them back behind. 
and then the economic impact. You know, so ASD um, has an impact of $268 billion on the U.S. economy every year. If we could just take, if just 10% of children and adults could uh, be improved, then that would basically re-inject an amount of $232 million or equivalent to 100 years of what NIH spends on research in uh, just with one year of an effective drug back in the American public, American economy. So I, I do want to mention, please, any of you who have a child who is three to 10 years of age and born in California, and would like to give your permission to, for us to go, go back to the dried blood spots that were collected at birth, that are now stored in you know, the State Health Department, for us to analyze um, uh, Please visit our website and, and um, come and, and, and talk to us. Uh, we're conducting a study where we're trying to use a, a, a thousand different molecules to see if we can accurately predict which children are at risk for autism um, uh, in an effort to intervene and potentially um, uh, even prevent some children from entering the autism spectrum, much the way that we do with PKU, for example, where if we catch it, it's a genetic disorder, we catch it early, um, we can, with diet and supplements, completely um, prevent um, the, the intellectual disabilities associated with PKU. So it's just a matter of pre-symptomatic detection, and we don't know how far we can push this, but uh, help us out if your child is three to ten. <laughs> I'll, I'll end up. So, thanks.